Hey guys, my name is Deanna. I'm an SI group leader for Biochemistry BCH 4024, and today I'm going to talk about the chymotrypsin mechanism. Before I get into the actual steps of the mechanism, I first want to review some terms that will help you better understand the process. The first term I have up here is nucleophile, and if you remember from organic chemistry, a nucleophile is something that's going to donate an electron pair in solution, while an electrophile is going to accept the electron pair. If you want to talk about this process in terms of protons, use the term general acid to refer to something that's going to donate a proton in solution, and general base to refer to something that's going to accept the proton. And here I have the amino acid residues that are capable of acting as a general acid or general base in solution. And those are aspartate, glutamate, lysine, tyrosine, cytosine, and histidine. And lastly, I have up here covalent catalysis, which just refers to a transient or temporary covalent bond that can form between enzyme and substrate. And here I have the residues listed that are able to act in covalent catalysis. And if you'll notice, those are all the same residues that can act as a general acid or general base, minus, of course, glutamate. The final thing that I want to go over before we get into the steps of the mechanism is what chymotrypsin actually does. Now, if you remember from your lecture notes, they tell you that chymotrypsin is a bo bovine pancreatic protease. And the only thing you need to get out of that is that it's a protease. A protease is an enzyme that's performing proteolysis, which is the breakdown of proteins. If you remember from the peptide bond chapter, you learned that proteins are formed when amino acids link together in polypeptide chains by peptide bonds. And those peptide bonds are formed from a dehydration reaction, so they're losing water. So in order for a protease, like chymotrypsin, to break these bonds, it needs to perform hydrolysis of this bond. So in other words, chymotrypsin is a protease performing proteolysis by hydrolysis of the peptide bonds. OK, so now we're going to get into the mechanism. As we just talked about, chymotrypsin is a protease that's going to be cleaving peptide bonds, but it's a specific protease. It's actually specific for cleaving at the C-terminal end of an aromatic polypeptide bond. And as you'll see in the example that we use here, I have a phenylalanine as the aromatic group, but just keep in mind that it can cleave at the C-terminal of any aromatic group, not just phenylalanine. What I want you to keep in mind as we're going through this mechanism is not the actual steps in which everything occurs, but more the general concepts that we're going to be talking about, such as what is acting as the general acid, what's acting as the general base, what's acting as a nucleophile, and what's acting as an electrophile. So now I'm going to go ahead and orient you to my model that I've drawn up here, because I know there's a lot going on. So what I've drawn in black here is the enzyme chymotrypsin itself. And I've clearly labeled the asparagine 102, histidine 57, and serine 195 residues. These three amino acids make up what's known as the catalytic triad, which is essentially the active site of the enzyme. Here in green, I have our generic polypeptide chain, with the N terminal being over here and the C terminal being over here. Here's where our aromatic group is sitting, in what's known as the hydrophobic pocket of the enzyme. And here our carbonyl group is sitting in what's known as the oxyanion hole. Over here I have the phase labeled, so in case you're ever reviewing this video, it's clearly labeled which phase we're working in. And I've also outlined a general flow of what's going to happen in each phase, starting with a positioning step, then histidine acting as a general base to deprotonate something. Once it deprotonates something, that something is going to nucleophilically attack another species. Then histidine 57 is going to act as a general base in order to protonate a species, which is going to become the leaving group, so that a product can be formed. And as you'll see in phase one, it's going to be the C-terminal product. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the mechanism. So first, we're going to have our positioning step. And in this case, it's just our polypeptide chain aligning itself with the active site of the enzyme. Of course, with the, the aromatic group going into the hydrophobic pocket, pocket and the carbonyl group going into the oxyanion hole. So in the next step, we're going to see histidine 57 acting as a general base. And the reason that histidine 57 can act as a general base is because this asparagine 102 residue makes it a better general base in solution. So histidine is going to act as a general base. And what do general bases do? They accept protons or take protons from things. And the easiest place for it to get a proton would be from the serine 195 residue. And its proton is actually all the way up here. 
So how it's going to take this proton is it's going to donate its electrons into this bond to take hold of this proton. As a result, serine is now going to have extra electrons. So it's going to act as a nucleophile and nucleophilically attack this carbonyl group down here. So that attack is going to break this double bond and kick these electrons out here in order to form a temporary hydrogen bond with this glycine residue down here. So this forms an unstable, short-lived intermediate structure. So now that histidine has just taken a proton from something, it's going to want to act as a general acid and go ahead and put that proton somewhere else or protonate something, and that something is going to become the leaving group. So the way that happens is that this short-lived intermediate collapses and this double bond is reformed. Now the electrons of this carbon, specifically at this bond, are going to donate back into this hydrogen here, and that's going to go ahead and dissociate these and reform this temporary hydrogen bond. So that's going to break this part of the peptide bond here, and you're going to end up with your first product. So that means this amine, which became the leaving group because it became protonated, is going to go ahead, take that proton, and you're going to end with your first product here. This is the C-terminal product. Remember, this is the N-terminal. And this will be your C-terminal product at the end of phase one. OK, now it's time for phase two. As you can see, there's been some changes here. The C-terminal product of the, or the C-terminal end of the polypeptide bond is now gone because it left as the C-terminal product. And as you can see, this hydrogen here that the histidine and serine were arguing over is also gone because it was used to protonate the leaving group that formed the C-terminal product in the first step. So as you can see, we're now in phase two and we're gonna be ending with the N-terminal product of the polypeptide bond. So let's get into phase two. Now, first, again, we're gonna start with the positioning step. But since the polypeptide is already in line with the amino, or with the enzyme active site, what needs to be positioned? Well, as you can see ahead in step two, histidine is gonna act as a general base again, so it's gonna need a proton from somewhere. So, as a result, the positioning step is actually gonna be the positioning of a water molecule as a source of protons for the histidine in the second step. So water goes ahead and slides into the active site of the enzyme. In the second step, histidine is going to act as a general base. So it's going to take this proton from the water there. So as a result, just as what happened before, this water is now going to have extra electrons and it's going to nucleophilically attack this carbonyl group again. And that's going to break this double bond again and kick the electrons back out to form the temporary bond with glycine again. And once again, we have a short-lived temporary intermediate. So this intermediate is going to want to collapse. And histidine is going to want to act as a general acid to protonate the, the leaving group once again. So these electrons get donated back in to reform this double bond, and now it's this bond that donates the electrons back into the hydrogen. So as a result, the serine is now the leaving group because it is protonated, takes back control of that proton, and the rest of our polypeptide chain here gains the addition of the OH group from the water. So now we have what is our N-terminal product. And that's at the end of phase two. So now, as you can see, our enzyme has been conveniently regenerated with serine gaining its original proton back and has seen, of course, having no proton. And then that means that we can go and do this whole process all over again. So just to review, in each phase, 
we first had a positioning step. In the first phase, it was the positioning of the polypeptide chain in the enzyme. In this case, in phase two, it was the positioning of the water molecule. Next, we had histidine acting as a general base to take a proton from something. In the first case, it was taking the proton from serine. In this case, it was taking the proton from water. Then we had a nucleophilic attack of the carbonyl group in each case. And finally, you had, had histidine acting as a general acid to protonate the leaving group. In the first case, the leaving group was the amine of the C-terminal product. In this case, it was the serine to regenerate the enzyme and to create our N-terminal product. Okay, that's the end of the chymotrypsin mechanism. If you have any questions, ask in lecture or ask your SI group leaders. Good luck on your test.